Hey, welcome to the six o'clock uh, time of prayer. <clears throat> I don't know if you had this morning. I was watching uh, Pastor Briggs, and yeah, my heart just broke for this brother. He's um, it's losing people around him. You know, son, not everyone has been able to identify with uh, with COVID nineteen in a, a personal way. Uh, outside of hearing about it and, uh, of course, the impact of, of what we're all going through uh, together as a society. But, um, you know, I, I have had a friend who had uh, the COVID-19 virus, but he, he was able to recover. <clears throat> He's actually still in recovery. It was, it's been a long, long haul for him. And he's a, he's a pretty healthy guy, too. So <sighs> this is all it's going to touch all of us in some way, shape or form here as we move forward. But. What I want to do today is I want to uh, pick up where we left off yesterday. Uh, like I was telling you, I wanted to do somewhat of a, a series, although I think we can close out today. Uh, one thing I've always enjoyed and the way I understand the scriptures um, has always been uh, the transition from Old Testament to New Testament. Once I started to see how those two operated together in unity, so many things happened for me. First of all, the Bible came alive to it. Um, but secondly, man, I just saw God's completed picture. Um, get to understand the Old Testament. You see the physical uh, realities representing a, you know, a spiritual principle. And then in the New Testament, you see spiritual realities representing a physical principle. And I want to talk about that today. Because yesterday we spoke of um, just misusing the temple of God and what that looks like. What that, you know, what, how, is it, how is that possible? Um, why did it take so long? Because it did. It took 380 years before the the Solomon's Temple was destroyed. Um, but there was warning after warning after warning, and sometimes we could take this like, well, if if the penalty doesn't come for 380 years, then maybe we'll be all right. But I want you to understand again, uh, for our Father in Heaven who stands outside of time, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years a day. So it's not a matter of our human perception of of time. Hey, man, I, I got all the time in the world, apparently. That's absolutely not true. But what we did discuss uh, yesterday, and I want to try and keep this a little more lighthearted. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank uh, Pastor Felicia Timmons again. Um, just so positive, man. So inspirational. Just, um, man, she really sees the power um, of God much more than I think uh, many of us do in the sense of moving forward and um, pressing on to something better. Um, I know for a fact, I don't know, I, of course I give God all the credit and glory for this, but uh, I don't. I know for a fact I wouldn't be doing what I do now, whether it's just for my job, being an executive pastor and helping out some, serving some of our fellow pastors, or, uh, or anything, I don't think I would be there if it wasn't for um, just the way God used Felicia, because, um, yeah, I, I had lost all that vision. All the stuff that she saw, um, I didn't see it. <laughs> it was, it was, I, I, I just didn't have it. So, uh, but that's why I always watch this, uh, sister's powerful woman, uh, preach when she does. And, uh, sometimes just the, the daily affirmations there on, on her page as well. Um, but anyways, let me just get into this. I want to talk about this correct, this idea of correct temple use last, uh, yesterday we talked about how, even though the kingdom had divided in the old Testament, uh, God had not divided the kingdom in his heart. Uh, men did that. Men decided, hey, we're going to do it this. And it was always the uh, same thing. It was always selfishness or greed, uh, just impure. It just it was uh, the motives were off. Um, and they no longer were worshiping and honoring God as king because they're in this new kingly era where they found out, um, hey, men can be kings. And why not me? Why is it just for God? And so you see this battle between Rehoboam and Jeroboam and Eventually, we get to this point where God has had enough and he does bring in a time of punishment and the temple is destroyed. You say, well, why is that? Well, God goes through an entire explanation, especially with Ezekiel. He said, look at what they're doing in my temple. Um, what abominations. There's male cult prostitutes. There's uh, Asherah poles on, on every uh, high place. There's, I mean, look at what is going on. Do you see it? Do you see what's happening? And he keeps asking this, this prophet, Ezekiel, do you see these things? Do you, son of man, do you see this? And uh, he did see it. 
but it was a little too late. By 2 Kings 25, Jerusalem finally, it falls, finally, at 587. It was uh, 380 years after the construction of uh, the temple. And Babylon, Babylonian kings came in and they destroyed Solomon's temple, no problem. But now we're transitioning into the New Testament. So we talked about, you know, the division of the kingdom corporately. Um, that this is not God's intention to, to separate and divide, but instead one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God is overall, in all, through all, uh, the end all, be all. You know what I mean? Uh, but here in the New Testament, you see a transition take place. So again, physical reality, physical temple, there's the building, there it is, there it is. I can go to there, um, completely destroyed because of idolatry and an incorrect usage of the temple. The, the reason the temple was in place, the reason these things were... They man just changed the rules, and uh, eventually, even though the the warnings were there, everything was it. Eventually, God had enough, and He would come in and and administer justice. So, you see that destruction. But here in the New Testament, times had changed. Okay, the people weren't so concerned uh, any longer with um, a lot. Of <laughs> they had no problem. Okay, so Rome came in. The Assyrians were bad. You thought the Babylonians were bad. You haven't tried Rome yet. Uh, Rome would come in and truly show what it's like to be oppressed. Truly show what it's like to have no rights and uh, no ability to worship, pray like your normal self. But uh, that would the, the tensions would ease after the Maccabean revolt. Um, you'd see, you know, by the time John the Baptist is here and Jesus arrives. Um, Essentially, Jerusalem and uh, Israel is under uh, the authority at this point of Rome. But it's not as restrictive. They could still, you know, pray and worship. They still have their temple, but they just had to adhere to Roman law and tradition and, of course, pay taxes. But I want to talk about this idea, this temple, um, because in the Old Testament, we saw it get desecrated and we saw the results of that. But in the New Testament, the temple changes because we're talking about Christianity now, right? We're not talking about uh, Judaism. We're not talking about the Old Covenant. We're talking about something new. So in the New Testament, the temple takes on new life. Ephesians chapter 2. So we went in the Old Testament. That's all we studied last week or yesterday. I'm used to doing weekly things. Yesterday. Today we're going to talk about the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 21, the Bible says this. In him, Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Okay, so let's let's think about the transition. There was a time where the temple was a building. Okay, then we understand that. It was destroyed for idolatry, uh, improper use. Now, we see this transitionary statement. Paul comes in and he's reminding the church in Ephesus, Hey, uh, I just want you guys to know that in Christ... This, this building, it, it rises, it becomes something. As the people come together, as we come together, as we rise, we become the holy temple. It's that old, I don't remember the church, the, some of you guys remember this, but uh, here's all the people. I don't, yay, I, I'm not that good at it, but uh, <laughs> the point still stands, is that the people are the temple, not the building any longer. That's an Old Testament design. That's an Old Testament tabernacle, but now a new and more perfect and lasting tabernacle has arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. And in him, not the temple, in him, we can become what the temple was originally meant to do. But in the same way, just as the Old Testament temple was used improperly, we can also use the New Testament temple improperly. What does that mean? Well, now instead of a corporate picture, now we can look to the individual. You and I represent the temple. I can misuse the temple of God. Um, I can use drugs. I can overeat. I can, you know, I mean, the list goes on. There's ways I can harm what God has given to me. I can harm the spirit that is placed inside of me. I can harm God's temple through the same means as the Old Testament was harmed. Through idolatry, through misuse, through a misrepresentation of what God originally intended. And in doing so, guys, I, I just, you know, point this out. I'm sure this is obvious at this point. We uh, we represent God very poorly at that time. Uh, our ambassadorship looks very, very weak at that time. Um, we can't even get it together amongst ourselves. So how are we going to impact the world? Um, if, if your only interest is impacting um, your fellow Lutherans, 
Um, that's a very small group indeed. And um, I don't know. No one was ever called to make a Lutheran, um, but they are called to make disciples of Jesus. And I think that's what we need to focus and concentrate on now. Not that I care or mind that someone would affiliate themselves with the denomination. I think that, that's not my point here. Hopefully that's coming across clear. I don't really care about that. But uh, corporately, as a body of believers, we can um, avoid desecrating the temple of God. The Old Testament, they had the law. They had a blueprint, but they felt like, hey, you know, many times as we read yesterday, it says God's not even watching. God doesn't care. <laughs> we can do this. We can set, We can do whatever we want. We can set up these structures. And we saw the northern kingdom. They really went crazy. Uh, and the southern kingdom, not that much better. Uh, a little bit better, but not that much. And eventually you saw the northern kingdom. They got punished first. The Assyrians came in and wiped them out. Money couldn't help them. They were a very wealthy nation, and it didn't matter. Later on, the Babylonians would come in, and they would destroy all of Judah, including Solomon's temple. So here's what the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says in verse 6. Now these things happen, we're talking about the Old Testament here, as examples for us, so that we wouldn't crave evil things just as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. And let's not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. And let's not test the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And let's not grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroying angel. Now these things happened to them as an example, and it was written down as a warning to us, on whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let us <clears throat> let the one who thinks that he stands watch out that he doesn't fall. No temptation has taken hold of you except what is common to mankind. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my dearly loved ones, flee from idolatry. So I think this is interesting because this is how the Old Testament desecrated the temple. Is They did it with idolatry. They did it with greed. They did it with uh, immorality. They did it with, they had, a, there's a reason they had shrine prostitutes. Is they, they wanted the sexual immorality. It was, you know, uh, Vegas 24-7. The, the region of Philippi, that was <laughs> little Las Vegas. That was a, a very immoral community there. And that's why it makes it even more uh, emboldening the way Jesus approached Philippi when he's, he gives one of his best, uh, that's one of his best, he gives a beautiful sermon while in Philippi. And it's it stands as even more radical than not because of the atmosphere. Uh, you and I can preach to brothers and sisters on the streets. That's fine. Uh, but you feel, you feel it when you're at the airport. I don't know if you've ever done I've, I got kicked out of the San Diego airport once. Um, but you know, you feel it because you don't know if people agree with you. You'd also think in your mind, if they don't agree with me, this could get ugly real fast. And so the, the sit the atmosphere made that different. But anyways, he says right here, I want you to flee from idolatry. Why would you and I individually have to flee from idolatry? Well, you can look at some of the basics. One, it's against the principles of God. If you idolize something, then you've put that above your father in heaven. So that's called idolatry. And he says, flee from idolatry. And he says, none of these, all these things happen as examples for us. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. Um, and then he says, hey, man, these guys, they, they lived a normal life. These people, they rose up, they sat, they ate, they rose to play. Um, don't commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And one day, 23,000 fell. That's a small nation. And 23,000 fell in one day. We're all panicking about this pandemic. And we haven't seen those kind of numbers in one day. And we're a much bigger nation. So is China. It says, and let's not test the Lord as some of them did. And we're destroyed by serpents. You guys remember that in Numbers chapter 11. And let's not grumble as some of them did. And we're destroyed by the destroying angel. Now these things happen as an example and a warning to us. So if these things happen as an example and a warning to us, to the temple, and now we recognize the temple is the people, you and I, you can see this call to flee from idolatry much more as a, hey, protect yourself from idolatry because it's going to draw you away from God into you are using this temple 
that I've given you by way of the Spirit in Christ incorrectly. So a lot of times people will look at this and they'll say, when I'm talking to uh, the lost, I will say, uh, you know, a lot of people will look at this and they'll say, oh, here's your do's and don'ts list. It's like, oh, God doesn't want you to do this. He doesn't want you to do that. And what we miss out on is really what God is trying to do is let you live the proper intended life, a life in which he created you for. And when you do that, when you operate under your creator's design, you operate efficiently. You operate, I mean, more than efficiently. You actually operate properly. You're performing the proper duties that you are designed for. And who are you designed after? Well, I, from what I understand, we're made in the image of God. So yeah, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You want to pay taxes? Do that. That's great. But do not forget to give to God what is God's and his image is on you. So it's you. Give yourself to the God, to your own God, to your God in heaven. This is the calling to, to flee from idolatry. Much more than just, hey, you don't get to do this anymore. No, it's if you do do this, you will be operating in a way that removes your effectiveness. It removes your efficiency because you're not operating as you're supposed to. I can use a steak knife as a spoon. I can do that. It'll put it'll put food on the in in my mouth. Now I, I might get cut, and I'll, I'm not going to get as much. And the point is, it's not going to work as effectively, but it can be done. Okay, you can be sexually immoral. But you can do that. Go for it. I, I'm not your God. I'm not your judge. You can do all these things. You can you can have idols in your life. You, you're allowed to do it. The free will. It's <laughs> it's there. People think it doesn't exist. It does. I wish it didn't. Sometimes I would stop making so many mistakes. But here it says it does. And I want you to run away from it. But it gets there's even more these principles. The same warning we see in the Old Testament is very much present in the New Testament. But it's, again, you have a physical reality uh, with spiritual principles in mind. Here you're looking at a spiritual reality with physical principles in mind. So it's not, it feels like it's not as intense, but it's actually twice as intense. Because now we're talking about spiritual eternal values. Okay, so let's look at this here. Um, uh, one thing that we know we can do. Uh, in order to avoid all of this is follow the warnings, follow the, the principles that have been put in front of us. One of them is, I think that you could walk away with at least three of these. One, one would be simply staying faithful. You're designed to stay faithful. Your faith, when you put your faith in Christ, you put your faith in an in internal, eternal being, meaning your faith is meant to last the duration your faith is meant to continue to grow. Your faith is meant. So if you're not feeding your faith, if you're not remaining faithful, you're operating outside of design. And this is why the panic can get so bad. This is why your fear can get so bad. It's because you haven't perfected your love for God. Because perfect love will drive out fear. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect. Not even close. I have fear all the time. I just told you in the beginning, I wouldn't even be preaching the word of God if it wasn't for other people coming in. They told me what my calling was. Deanna, uh, Ray, Patrick, um, these band of wild prophets pulled me aside and they instilled that into me. And I thought me and Ray were boys, man. I thought we were close like this. And he attacked me and told me how awesome he thought I was. <laughs> Sometimes you can be attacked with encouragement. And so it's been my honor to try and attack them right back and let them know, hey, I think you're amazing. Trust me on this one. So I want to share this story with you when it comes to remaining faithful, because I saw this. Um, this was a brother sent this to me years ago, and I saw this and it fascinated me. I had to look it up and it's real. Um, there is a place. There's a such thing as called the Koinea Farm. OK, this was actually started in the 40s in the deep south. OK, and it was the idea was uh, there was a farm that was helping and uh, feeding both poor white farmers and poor black farmers. Now in the South, this didn't go over well because segregation was a huge deal at that time still. I think sometimes we forget that this country was so divided by race uh, for so long. And it wasn't that long ago that we began to, to, to come together. And of course we got ways to go, but it's much better than it was. But 
I think, you know, <laughs> we got to recognize that this wasn't that long ago. These are not uncommon stories. But in the 40s, this man Clarence started this Koinea farm for poor blacks and poor whites, and he was a man of deep faith. Okay. However, in the South, again, he was getting all kinds of flack. And I mean, the newspaper, everyone was essentially mocking him, but he didn't care. He just kept feeding people. He just kept taking care of people. He just kept doing what he knew to be true. He stayed faithful in the face of adversity. And what kind of adversity did he face? Well, 11 years into his farming, the KKK came in and they had had enough. Okay. And they burned it. They started burning everything. They burned all the crops, all the fields. Um, they started, there was one, they started burning the houses because this is a little, com, almost a community. One couple, black couple decided they weren't going anywhere. They stayed and so did Clarence in his house. When it was the next day, a reporter came to the farm and they saw Clarence and they kept trying to ask him questions. But Clarence was busy. Clarence was busy because he was replanting his farm. He was doing everything he knew how to do without bitterness, anger. He just got about the business at hand and he started planting and the reporter kept prodding and poking and wanted to get a response. And finally, the reporter asked this question, do you feel successful after all of this? Was it a success to do this? And it was a mock. It was mocking. To, and in that time, it wasn't seen as mocking. It was seen as, I told you, man, you can't be trying to do all these crazy ideas just because you read something in the Bible that says <laughs> all nations and stuff like that. No, 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 no. That's not how we do things here. But Clarence was a kingdom resident much more than he was a resident of Mississippi. He, he belonged to the kingdom of God before he belonged to the, to the Mississippi state border. Does that make any sense? And so he, this is his, I'm going to quote this, okay? Because, man, this is so powerful, but this is so telling of what it takes to have faith. Everything was gone. People had come in and destroyed it for no good reason. A reporter's mockingly asking, hey, was this a success? Was it, do you feel successful with all of this, feeding all these people and stuff? Was it worth it? They asked him if he was success. And so uh, he says, quietly but firmly, and this is quoted, about as successful as the cross. Sir, I don't think you understand us. What we're about is not success, but faithfulness. We're staying. Good day. And he kicked him off the farm. The day, the, all right, so this Koinea farm, it's still in existence today. It should have died in 1951. It should have, it should have ended. But Clarence stayed faithful. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was about. He knew what he was serving. Did it go against the culture of his time? Absolutely, he, it did. No, there's no doubt about it. He's in the South in the 40s. And he's feeding black families. This is godly work. And when they came in and they tried to destroy it, he got right back to work. You see, anyone that looks back when they have their hand to the plow, they're not fit for the kingdom of God because you've got to be all in. You have, look, when God says, I'm going to make you the temple of God, remember all destruction details remember all the work remember even the traveling tabernacle remember all the functionality of the the temple what it meant to the people what it meant to god god gave specific instructions i need it built this way it's got to function in this way and when they started to remove the functionality when they started to treat it differently it's like, oh, well that's great but now we're going to put this on the wall and now i'm going to take this down and now i'm going to do this and now I'm when you yourself become the temple, that is a great honor. What a God we serve to be invited into his family in such a way, to not just be a family member, but also be a representation of all that God is. That's what the temple was supposed to do. You remember when Daniel prayed, he prayed, you know, when he was over in Babylon, he, he didn't have, or excuse me, yeah, he prayed towards the temple because that's where God's name was. You remember that from yesterday. It says, I, I put my name here. My, my name is going to be great because of this temple. I'm putting my name here and here alone. Well, now you're the temple. Guess where God's name is? 
It's in your heart. Now, there's a time now where we need men and women to step up and start praying and just giving and serving again. You say, well, what can I do? Just be the temple. Just be faithful to your design. Just be faithful to your function. You are God's child. You see what I'm saying? I learned that from Stephen. <laughs> I learned that from the scriptures, but I also learned it from Stephen. You're God's child. What an honor that is. That's the greatest title you'll ever own. It's not pastor. It's not preacher. It's not teacher. It's not evangelist. None of those titles are as precious and sanctified as child of God. Not to mention, we'd also find out you're part of this royal priesthood. You, you are not only are you a part of the royal priesthood, which is a person, you're the actual functioning temple when we're together. The temple's strength depends on you and I. The functionality of the temple depends on you and I. And we can either do it right and live a life of love, or we can continue to satisfy ourselves. And when we do that, yeah, it'll work. It's like eating soup with a knife. You can make it happen. It's going to take a lot longer. <laughs> it's not going to be as enjoyable, but you'll have the vain satisfaction of knowing you didn't need a spoon. That's not going to do you any good. <laughs> Instead, you see another person right to your right or left, and they're eating with a spoon, and it looks a whole lot easier. It looks a whole lot more satisfying. And you know what? It is. My food's not going to get cold by the time you're over there trying to eat soup with a knife. That's life without God. Oh, I can do it. You sure can. But you're going outside of your function. Can you make that happen? Can it work? Yeah, it'll work. Sure. No problem. Will it work properly? Nope. Because that's not what we're designed for. And I'm speaking to Christians today. I know I am because I'm on the middle cross page. And that's why I'm speaking the way that I am. I know that you know these things. This is a reminder. Praise God. Uh, another one is just rejecting the gods, um, foreign gods, um, just uh, rejecting idolatry. You see some of these words come together. We'll see it as we go through Ephesians and close out. But when you reject idolatry, one of the greatest idols in this world is the mirror. It's you and I. We, we've become idols to ourselves. I mean... <laughs> You know what a selfie is? Of course we do. Of course we know what a selfie is. Of course we know what a selfie is. It's when you take a picture of yourself and you put it on the internet. Uh, I'm not, I am not got anything bad about, against it. I'm just saying our society is curving to facilitate self-idolatry. Um, just look at all the magazines we, we have and things. You know, I, I don't even have to go far from that. But the other one is just avoiding temptation by being a living sacrifice. I'm going to go through Ephesians. All three of these things that I think we can follow, they're all found in this one passage. So we'll go through them individually. But in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, the Bible says this, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So you see the word sacrifice, and people get very frightened by this. So I'm not giving up this. I'm not giving up that. I'm not giving. Uh, we have a church here in town that's trying to sue the government because we won't let them get together. That's madness. Uh, I don't even want to get into that. That's I, I will go on forever talking about that stuff. But he says right here, I want you to live, be an imitator of God. Therefore, why? Well, because God's image is on you. If His image is on you, if you look like Him, He's going to want you to act like Him. I have children of my own. I'm a procreator. Okay, I'm not a creator. I'm a procreator. There, that my image is on my children. But if all they do is look like me, then I'm not going to be satisfied because I need them to act like me. I want them to follow. I want to be able to be an example to them. Uh, so much so that they take my qualities. They take my character, my integrity, things that I value. And, and I pass that on to them much more than just my outward appearance. So we all have the image of God, but do you have his heart? Do you have a spirit? Are you practicing your life in the manner in which it was created for? This is a good question for all Christians. So you could also avoid temptation in this world by fleeing from impurity. I, 
I know so many, bro. I've talked to, I was a campus minister for many years. I know impurity is a big deal. <laughs> I'm not unaware of these things. But I also know that there's one escape, the only thing I've ever found that works, and I call it the Joseph principle. And I think that's fleeing for from impurity at the highest level. But when I, you know, you feel those, those, uh, that time of just numbness in your heart, run, get outside, run, get out of the house, move, go, take off, leave. Uh, sometimes I'll do push ups, sometimes I'll scream. These are all things I started to practice in my late 20s. <laughs> And uh, I'm not ashamed to admit it because it worked, man. <laughs> if you run, if you get your endorphins, all this, the, the, the way that God designed the body, you just get out, get, run, flee. I'm talking about flee. Why? Because I don't want to go against my design. Because the moment I do it, yes, I'll be gratified. There's no doubt about it. But everyone knows what comes after the gratification is guilt and remorse. It's never worth it. It's never worth it. You eventually have always got to pay the price for your perversion. You've got to. And it went against the design. Now, had we gone with the design, we would have found victory. And, and everyone knows these things. And I think this is what makes it hard. But we're going to talk more practically on how we just live this life. Because I think, again, if you focus in on key words and you get scared by them, well, you'll never pursue them. Uh, but here's what the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 3, as we continue down in Ephesians says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. The word holy is now put on the people where it was once reserved for God himself and his temple. Okay, now you see this transition in the New Testament. You're the ones that are holy. You're the ones that are called out. You're the ones that are sanctified. You're the ones that are separated. And I say you, but I'm a part of that. Amen. <laughs> but this is, this is, he says, I don't even want to see a hint. And look at the three that he puts together. And you'll notice these three are always together. They're interconnected. They're in sexual immorality, impurity. And then he says of greed. He said, well, why greed? Well, there is no impurity or sexual immorality without selfishness. Selfishness is the basis for greed. These three operate demonically together. And so here you see this, this idea. Is like when I say flee, I'm talking about run. Get away. The Bible is very clear. It'll say things, and I don't know if we take them serious. I don't know, but it says, I want you to cling to what is good, but then flee from what is evil. Take off, leave, run, do something. Change your pattern. Change your, your environment. Get. I'm begging you. Why? Because you're part of God's temple. I can only make up the part of the temple that God has given to me. But I rely on the rest of us to come together so we can make a beautiful, holy temple before God. So it's important for each Christian to try and reach out and build up their fellow Christian. To never stop encouraging as long as it's called today. Why? You represent God. I don't want our God to be mocked. I don't want our God to be laughed at. I don't want our God to, I don't want people to look at it and say, oh, it's just a bunch of, you know, whatever they say. I want them to say they've, they're forced to be silent. They're forced to have reverence. Because why? Because they see your good deeds. And mine. Amen. And then avoid immorality by giving thanks. This is another defense that we're given. This is another tool in the toolbox given to a Christian. Remember this, all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the man of God is thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, if you're training in righteousness, I want you to know, training is a daily activity. It's something you do all the time. So you have to train to be righteous, okay? And he says, I want you to, let me, let me just read this, okay? <laughs> Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place but rather thanksgiving. So when you're in that mode and you're being pulled by your own desire and we're being pulled by our own temptation, God says, I'm going to provide a way out for you. What's that way? Thanksgiving, honor, praise. This is your way out. It says no temptation that sees you except what is common to man, but God will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. What's the way out? In this case, if we're talking about coarse joking, uh, obscenities. They're out of place, meaning it doesn't make sense for the temple of God to go around doing that. It doesn't make any sense. 
It's like, oh, but that's my freedom. You're so incorrect in that. You need to show me that in the scriptures. Because I know that you're not supposed to use that freedom as a cover up for sin. And it's clear that obscenity and foolish talking, coarse joking are out of place. But for who? Well, if you read in context, we're talking about God's people. It says, but rather thanksgiving. Honor God during these times. What do you, This whole idea of attacking at 6, 12, and 6, this is a way to honor God. This is a way to remove wrath. This is a way to show God, hey, we, we hear. I, I don't want to be the northern kingdom. I don't want to be Judah. I don't want to be the old temple that was destroyed. I want to be the temple that's built up in Christ Jesus, which is eternal, which is forever. Amen? Finally, Free from temptation by remembering whose child you are. I think your identity in Christ is so big. I had lost that. I, I was not thinking like that for a long time. My church that I was a part of, it split. And it was ugly. It was gross. This is a, many, many years ago, but still, it, it changed me. And then I went to seminary and I was refreshed and renewed. God put people around. He knew what he was doing. And I think... Ultimately, what happened is I recognized I wasn't being who I was supposed to be. God had an idea for my identity. He had a plan for my existence. And instead, I had, I, just like a sheep, I, we'd all, we had gone our own way. But when you recognize that it was my iniquity that was laid upon him to bring me peace, now you, change, you have a mindset change. You have, you have to face some decisions. Do you continue to put Jesus on the cross? So that there's no more sacrifice left for you? Or do you honor the sacrifice, recognizing you were bought at a price, and you are not your own? I swear I told myself I was going to be encouraging today. <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, but we aren't. We're not our own. Um, we are subject and servant. We are friends. We are brides. This is a beautiful and honor, uh, a position of honor. And we treat it. Like, ah, oh, I got to do, oh, I got to go to church again. I got to, uh, oh, at six o'clock, here comes crazy uh, Liddell and his gang. We got to listen to them again, I guess. And you don't have to. But what does God want from you? You don't need to listen to me. Grab a Bible. Stop pretending we all know everything and let's start learning from each other. Let's start remembering things. Sometimes Mature Christians are like, I already know that. I've read that several thousand times. Well, good for you. Read it again until it comes into your heart and it plants and it begins to produce something in your words, produce, to produce something in your action. We're going to recognize you by your fruit. And if you're a bad tree that claims that that bad fruit is your freedom in Christ, you don't know who Christ is. And it's a shame because you're dishonoring the temple. And you were never created for that. For of this, you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. You see the three of them together again. Immoral, impure, greedy. Such a man is an idolater. Idolatry is a source of greed. Do you, does that make sense? You don't think we idolatrize the, uh, the mighty dollar in this country? For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. You don't remember whose kid you are. In the South, this is a big deal. Um, I'll give you this small example. If someone says your mama about anything, and we do in the South, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't. <laughs> Some of you from Florida, Bruce Mackey, uh, let these brothers and sisters know that I'm not lying. You could spill a drink on, you spill your Coke on the floor, like your mama spills Coke on the floor. It doesn't have to make sense. You just say it because you know it's going to offend deeply. Someone says something about my mom. That's it. We have to fight. That's there's no I got no recourse. You put me in a corner. You put me in a position that I can't. It's not even a matter of violence or me being a, a, a bad individual. As that was the code of the South when I was growing up in Florida. 
you say something about my mom, you, I have got to deal with this. My family's reputation depends on it. What if I don't do anything? Then everybody knows that, you know, man, I, either one, I don't love my mom or two, I'm a punk. <laughs> either way, in the South, that didn't play. Now, that was my worldly experience. How has that aided me in my godly experience? Well, very simply, I don't want to dishonor my father. And people speak badly of my father because the temple is in disrepair. The temple is not operating as a light on the hill. It's about what, the temple is you. The temple is me. And if we're not operating, then how could we be that light on the hill? How could we be that inspiration? How could we show everyone the gospel is attractive? Jesus is Lord. He came to rescue, save, and love you. That all doesn't make any sense if you're living a life that doesn't, that's not proper to the design. I'm not talking about perfection. Okay? Love mercy. You're going to need it. But act justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. Love your neighbor just like you love yourself. Love. Sometimes I think we're too caught up in the vanity of trying to be perfect. We're too caught up in, uh, you know, trying to gain some, I don't know, some high ground on people or something. that We don't need, let me give you this. I wrote down this quote here. Actually, I copied it from IMDb. Uh, but this is from the Hoosiers. And if you haven't seen Hoosiers, shame on you. That's a fine film. <clears throat> but this is at the end of the movie, and Coach is talking to his team. They're in the the, uh, the the national finals, which was seemingly impossible for their little school. It says, forget about the crowds, the size of the school, their fancy uniforms, and remember what got you here. Focus on the fundamentals. We have gone over this time and time again. And most importantly, don't get caught up in thinking about winning and losing this game. If you put your effort and concentration on playing to your potential, being the best you can be, I don't care what the scoreboard says at the end of the game, in my book, we're going to be winners. God can give this pep talk to us. Be what I have designed you to be. Be the church. Be the kingdom. Be that holy temple. Be the city on the hill, the light. The beacon in a dark world. Be that. Don't worry about if you're winning or losing. If, if oh man, I said this is a mistake. I, that's we're not to ask call to live like that. I'm I'm not talking about robotic faith. Okay, you're a human. You're you're gonna make mistakes. You know, welcome to the club. Stop making willful mistakes and claiming that that's your freedom. I can't stand that, and I think that's one of the greatest errors in the church today. Is thinking that freedom in Christ means. Um, yeah, well, it doesn't affect my conscience, so I kind of do what I want to do. That's awesome. Who cares about your conscience? What has God put on your heart? How has God designed you? Your conscience, of course, is going to walk away from God. Why do you think you have to deny yourself and carry a cross daily? It's because every single day when you wake up, you're still you. And guess what? You and I are very much sinners. We have a sinful nature, meaning... By nature, without denial, without self-denial, without putting the cross, without recognizing who you belong to. By nature, you will walk in a different direction. To call that freedom is disgusting. Freedom in Christ is having the power to live as you are intended to live. Be an agent of love. Be Christ's ambassador. Be a brother. Be a sister to someone. Why well, I saw Liddell down this morning, that messed me up. What encouraged me is the same thing that always encourages me. See, I, my job, which I enjoy, is I serve pastors. I don't pastor. I, I don't preach on Sundays and stuff like that anymore. I, um, I don't even know how I ended up in the position I'm in now. <laughs> it just happened. But uh, pastors will read the people and give the people as, you know, try and meet needs, uh, just as Christ did as Master Shepherd. My job is to read the pastor. And figure out how to encourage, uplift, and motivate, and discipline in such a way that I make sure that they are fulfilling their function as the temple so that they can instruct others to help out in the same way, bring their level of faith up with them. And one thing I will say is you, you figure out people's love languages. You know, I know what, I got a brother up in Washington that is an awesome pastor. I mean, an awesome pastor. Uh, very simplistic to the point. 
very stern, very uh, a lot of integrity in his, his teaching. And he has some fun up there, man. You know, he's good. He's a funny guy. He has a good time up there. But he's if I don't if I didn't learn how to start talking about fishing first, we would have never gotten anywhere. We would have never we would have never reached, you know, gotten to a, a level of trust where I could say things. Hey, bro, I think you're doing this wrong. And here's why I say it. I would have never been able to get to that point had I not learned his love language. This brother loves fishing and uh, he claims to be from Georgia. And I tried to tell him in a nice way. Georgia doesn't know nothing about fishing. I'm from Florida. Let me tell you how it's done. And uh, <laughs> and we would get into it. But and then afterwards, we'd have such a salty conversation. We began to talk about God's love for his people. We began to talk about how we can help one another uh, help his people, help God's people. Um, that we He's not alone. He's a small church and he doesn't have all the help that a lot of big churches have. But I'm there. I'll listen. Let's go. And in doing so, this is a way where we can build each other up. We can help each other. We can encourage each other. It's happened for me. I'm desperate to do it for others. But it doesn't make any sense if you just have this group of people and you try and, you know, sometimes look at them like they're super Christians. They're not super Christians. They're just Christians. They're just following. When you follow, you look like a superstar. But you're not. You're simply doing a, d- a duty that's been discharged to you by purpose, by design, by set, by foreknowledge. God had an understanding of what the temple was supposed to represent in the Old Testament. It was used incorrectly and it got wiped out. God knows what his temple is supposed to look like in the New Testament under his son. Okay? And we see warning after warning after warning, even in the New Testament. But guys, the choice is not up to the Assyrians. It's not up to Babylon. It's not even up to COVID-19. It's up to you and I. What was the difference? The Old Testament, they never repented. They didn't get to that place before it was too late. You and I, the, the warnings are on the wall. We've seen it. We, all of us, the mature, they've been talking about, man, church has become a circus. Uh, we got pastors coming down from the ceiling with smoke. Um, you don't even know if you're paying tithe anymore or the price of admission. It's like, a, it's, a, it's a show. We've all said these things. But now it's time, the, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, those congregations are not getting together right now. And it's sad. It is sad. Guys, we have to come back to our first love. Repent. Do the things we did at first. Come back to our first love, who is Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. My King, your King, our Deliverer. He has a design for our life. And the truth is, as smart as we think we are, Our ways are not his ways. His thoughts much higher than ours. We can trust that he understands the design for our life and wouldn't put us in harm way. You've got to come to these conclusions that God is a good God and he has not been lying to you, but he's been promoting and prompting and pushing you towards the truth. Why? So instead of being darkness as you once were, he doesn't say in the darkness. He says you were darkness. Now you are light, not in the light. Okay, this is not a game. It's not a light switch. You were once darkness. You were once lost, gone. Dark, not in darkness, but darkness itself. Now you are light. Not in the light. Not, oh, I've been enlightened. No, now you are saved. Now you have salvation. Now you are the temple. Now it's time for us to show that to the world. To God be everything. To God be everything. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for this time. And um, Lord, I lift you up, Father. God, I praise your name, Father. There is nothing like you. Father, I pray for the forgiveness of our sins, Father. I pray for my own forgiveness, a sinner, Father. I pray you have mercy on me. I think about the times where I have put the cross down so that I could pursue something for myself. I think about the times where I've just I said, I'll just let it slide because I don't I don't have I don't have the energy for all this. I got tired and weary of doing what was good because I couldn't see any benefit to it. And it was such a greedy and selfish move. I couldn't see benefit to me. And therefore, I dishonored you, Father. God, I thank you for your mercies. They're new every morning. I thank you for the forgiveness of sin, for your son's blood on the cross, the work that he did on my behalf. God, I pray for those that are 
hurting right now in this world. I pray for the COVID-19 victims, God. I pray that you heal and I pray that you uh, redeem, God. Your will be done in their life, Father. Father, I pray for those who are putting out such great efforts, Father. I pray for uh, Pastor Briggs and his family, not because he's a pastor, but because of his incredible efforts, Father. I pray for Irene McCown, not because she's a deacon. Um, I believe I saw that. Uh, but, Father, because of her heart, God, because of the spirit that she continues to put forward, even as today she mentioned she's tired. This is not easy. Lord, I pray for Felicia uh, Timmons. God, I thank you so much for this, sister. I pray you continue to bless her with wisdom. I pray you continue to pour wisdom into her mind and heart. Because I know that she won't keep it for herself. Father, I pray for Pastor Stephen Underwood. I've never met anyone like him. I've never seen anyone that can preach and teach with such passion and authority. He, he doesn't just preach. Oh, my goodness. There's teaching. There's a lesson there, Father. I, I Again, please enrich, I, I say, make that even greater, Father, for him. Not for his glory, but for yours, and I know that's the way he sees it. Father, I pray for all of my brothers and sisters, God. I'm grateful. I pray for Travis Rogers, Father. I can't wait to get him onto Facebook one day <laughs> so he can see what's going on. He can see how what was once just an evil entity, the Internet, Father, is being used, God, to worship, to honor you to teach lessons, to be real with each other, to confess our sins to each other, to admit that we're tired, to admit that this COVID-19 thing has got us down, to admit that we feel pain when we know that this world is suffering. We don't have a philosophy of never let them see a sweat. This is not the world. This is your kingdom. And in your kingdom, we have reality. We have truth. We have real manna to eat. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would continue to watch over, bless, continue to encourage, continue to strengthen your saints at this time, Father. Lord, to you be all glory, honor, and praise. And I pray that we will treat this temple that you've given to us, Father, for its intended pur purposes. And that is to honor and to praise you and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, Father. I can only imagine what the world would look like. Except I wouldn't call it the world anymore. I probably have to call it heaven. Lord, to you be all glory and praise, Father. I, I thank you, God. I also thank you for Juanita Dotson. And pray that she, uh, this awesome mother in, uh, in the faith, has an incredible birthday. And uh, thank you for Carolyn Nellens to uh, put that up there and remind us all it was her birthday. <laughs> Father, to you be the glory and praise. We love you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Uh, guys, I hope you have a great day and enjoy yourself in Christ.